Now that we've restored power to Nuka World, it's time to tie up a few loose ends. In episode 2 of this series, we got two quests when we visited Nuka Town, USA. One was from Sierra Petrovita, can't be in a haystack, and the other was from Nira, Precious Metals. To complete Precious Metals, we have to track down a park medallion from many of the unique rides and attractions around Nuka World. This is actually a simple quest. Nira told us where they all are, so it's just a matter of going through all of the parks to find them. I showed off each park medallion machine in my videos covering each of the parks, but to sum up, we find one as we leave Nuka Galaxy. Incidentally, after restoring power to Nuka World, we see that the Nuka Girl animatronic has spawned a new Nuka Girl suit. If we looted one before restoring power to the park, in this way we can get two. But we find this medallion machine at the top of the steps leading to the ramp out of Nuka Galaxy. The next one is inside Vault Tech Among the Stars. We find this one after exploring the exhibit at the end of the final Space Warp Walk. There are two in the Kitty Kingdom. One is near to the line outside the Ferris Wheel. And incidentally, once power is restored, we can turn the Ferris Wheel on. Thankfully, it hesitates a moment before moving, allowing us ample opportunity to jump into one of the cars. And it gives us a breathtaking view of Nuka World, especially at night, with the park lit up. The next one in Kitty Kingdom is at Nuka Racers. We find the line to the Nuka Racers west of the Bottle Cave. And here on the other side of a fence is the Park Medallion Dispenser. The next is in Mad Mulligan's Mine in Dry Rock Gulch. This one is simple, it's inside the gift shop, which is locked until we explore the entire mine. The next one is in the Safari Adventure. We find it in Cappy's Treehouse. Cappy's Treehouse is at the center of a hedge maze, and once we solve the maze, and ride the elevator to the top, we find the medallion dispenser. And the final one is just outside the World of Refreshment. We find it in the pre-war line to board the boats for this attraction. Once we've collected all of the medallions, we can head back to Nuka Town, USA and turn them into Nira. Hi there! I've got a full set of park medallions. So you do! Why, that's just Nuka-tastic! Here's your special reward. What else would you like to know? No questions for now. In that case, thanks for... Error. <laughs> System d d malfunction. You're still here? Get the hell out of my face, you miserable, dung-sniffing dirt scratcher. System restored. Have a great day. We complete precious metals, but our reward for doing so is one Nuka Cola Dark, one Nuka Grape, and one Nuka Cola Quantum. How disappointing. What an underwhelming quest. But then again, it is a pre-war scavenger hunt, and it was designed for children, so I guess it does make sense within the lore of this park. But hopefully, Sierra Petrovita has something better for us. We met her in episode 2 of this series, and she told us why she was here. She is looking for hidden cappies strewn around the parks. She gave us a booklet that contained hints to where each cappy was hiding. I showed off the location of each of these in my videos dedicated to the parks. But to sum up, we find two in Dry Rock Gulch. The first is in the graveyard on the back of one of the southern gravestones. The next is in Mad Mulligan's Mine. Just after we find the corpse of Terry Tanaka, we continue down the tunnel until we see a bit of a shack right next to a waterfall. On the outside is the next cappy. There are two in the Galactic Zone. The first is just outside Starport Nuka. We recall that trader camp built in the employees section behind it. And here on a wall next to the gate and an employees only sign is the S cappy. The next one is at the very end of the spacewalk right outside the Robco Battle Zone. At the end of the spacewalk, if we turn right, we find this on a nearby wall next to some garbage cans. This is the first R Cappy. There are two in the Kitty Kingdom. The first is in the Fun House. Traveling through the Fun House, if we explore all the way into the spinning floor, one of the doors, a red one, has an empty room with a Cappy in a spotlight against the wall. The F Cappy. Then just outside of King Cola's castle, if we go south across the bridge, we find a 
bit of a clock tower. If we scale the clock tower at the very top, we find the eye cappy. There's only one in the world of refreshment. Inside the ride, we find it on the back of one of the buildings during the Wild West portion of the ride. It's right next to a cactus. There's one in Nukatown, USA. This is in the same area as that fountain and pool right next to the stroller drop-off area. We find it against a concrete wall. And finally, there are two in the Safari Adventure. One is in the hedge maze. It's down one of the wrong paths, can be tricky to find. Starting from the beginning of the maze, we find this cap if we turn right, right, left, left, and then right. It's against a brick wall dead end. And the final one is right next to the primate house, where we spent a lot of time with Sito. To the right, we see a big gorilla statue. And if we look closely, there's a bit of a gap in this hedge. Walking through the brambles, if we turn right, we see the end cappy. And that's all 10 clues. I better get these back to Sierra and see if she can make them. After discovering all the clues, we can head back to Nukatown, USA, where we find Sierra Petrovita waiting outside Brad Burton's office. I found all of the hidden cappies. Each one had a letter. Great! Let me take a look at these letters. Well, anyone who stared at Nuka-Cola merchandise as long as I have would get this one pretty fast. The letters definitely spell refreshing. It's simpler than I was expecting. Well, of course it's simple. The contest was meant for kids. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I guess sometimes I take all of this Nuka-Cola stuff so seriously. Oh, well, damn. I was sure the letter spelled fresh ginger. That stuff is great in hot tea with honey, lemon, little brandy, a lot of brandy. Nice try, but you'd be one G short. So let's just assume it's refreshing. I got your code. Now you owe me, so pay up. Hold on. We haven't gotten into Brad Burton's office yet. That was the deal, remember? So how do we use this code? This door should lead to Brad Burton's office, but it's locked up tight. The keypad is the only way to open it. I guess we just need to key in the 10 numbers that correspond to the word refreshing. You did all the work looking for the hidden copies, so you should be the one who gets to enter the code. We see a number pad that says, enter your code here. The uh, strange thing is that it is a number pad, not a letter pad. But the code is all letters. <laughs> we don't even see any letters on these numbers. I guess we just treat it like telephones. Two is A, B, C, three is D, E, F, etc. That's it! The door's unlocked! Let's go inside! As soon as we enter, Sierra races through reception, into an adjoining room, and up a staircase. This top level must be his office, and here she must just walk around. But before we explore up here, let's explore downstairs. Now, savvy viewers will recall that I've done a video on this place before, but last time, my game was suffering from a horrifying bug a bug that robbed us of most of the story. The bug was not unique to my game. I've seen people complaining about it all over the place. To this day, I don't know why some of my characters have this bug when they enter the office and others don't. But thankfully, the bug did not appear with this character. So I'm gonna take the opportunity now to explore all the lore we find here, even if it means treading a bit of old ground. All we find in this reception area is a bathroom with nothing inside, and there's nothing in this next room. So heading upstairs to Brad Burton's office, we see that he has a small Nuka-Cola display case. A standard Nuka-Cola, a cherry, and a quantum. We can take these. We see a bottle statue, a Nuka-Cola machine in the corner, and Brad Burton's desk to the northeast with a Nuka-Cola on it. We also find a Nuka World contest flyer. This has all of the camp in a haystack clues that were on the holotape that Sierra gave us. And next to this is a holotape labeled Nuka-Cola Clear. In regards to Nuka-Cola Clear production, I think it's obvious that we need to take a step back and examine the facts. Project Cobalt dropped Quantum in our laps, so I think it's best we leverage its potential popularity before someone else beats us to market. Additionally, Installing the equipment to produce both flavors would cost us a pretty penny, and I'd rather use the funds to promote Quantum. We also have our lemon-lime flavor debuting soon, 
and need to work out how to market two clear colored flavors simultaneously. With all these factors taken into account, I have no choice but to hold off Nuka-Cola clear production for at least the next two fiscal years. We first learned about Nuka-Cola Clear in Fallout 3. We found the Nuka-Cola Clear formula in the Nuka-Cola bottling plant, which I covered in my video on Sierra Petrovita from Fallout 3 that you can watch here. In that video, we wondered why they had the formula here in this plant, but the drink never went into production. This holotape clears it all up, with Project Cobalt Nuka-Cola Quantum and the as-of-yet unnamed other lemon-lime flavor Nuka-Cola drink all under production they were just too busy. Checking out Brad Burton's terminal, we see that from here he was able to monitor Nuka World's status. Everything naturally is closed, but from here we can read some of his personal mail. In the first one, outgoing mail, to Giles Mainsgrove, vault Special Projects Division. This was outgoing mail, so it was written by John Caleb Brad Burton himself. Just wanted to reach out and say thank you for the work you've done on my private sanctuary. With the installation of the control switch, work is finally complete. Amusing anecdote to share about the final day, the engineers needed to know where to place the access switch. Obviously, I wanted it concealed, but where? Then the answer came to me. It should be placed near my greatest creation, the very reason for my success. I think we can both agree that it was an inspired choice. Thanks for everything, Giles. The money has been wired to your account. So John Caleb Brad Burton worked on a special project with vault -Tec? And there's a secret access switch? Where? In this room? In the next one, incoming mail from Peyton Huxley, executive assistant. Sir, I've cleared your schedule as you requested for the latter half of the entire year. I can assure you this was no small feat. Also, your medical records have been transferred to Braxton's team and all of the backup copies destroyed. I hope you know what you're doing, sir. If you go through with this process, you may never be able to speak in public again. We can certainly work around that, but your presence has been the driving force behind the Nuka-Cola Corporation since the beginning, and I think it will be a great loss if that were to change. Why did he need his calendar cleared? Where was he going that so worried Peyton? And who is Braxton? And why does Braxton need John Caleb Bradburton's medical records? In the next one, outgoing mail, to Peyton Huxley, executive assistant, I've considered your proposal for shutting down the Galactic Zone to overhaul the Star Control mainframe and its robots, and I have to say I am taken aback by the suggestion. If there's one thing I've taught you, it's that no matter how tough things get, we never give up. Tell the manager over there that he'll just have to hunker down and make do with what he has. I've poured billions into that park, and I'm not about to watch it trickle away by closing the gates. As far as disarming the robots in the park, that's also a no. If things go south at Nuka World, that force of robots is the only protection we have. Cooperating with Robco was the only way I could get that type of weaponry allowed outside of a military base. So suck it up and get whatever his name moving over there to fix this problem. This is a direct response to an intramail we read while exploring star control in the Galactic Zone an urgent message from Penning over at Starport Nuka. The manager over there complained that the advanced star control system by Robco didn't work very well with the older model Protectrons currently used in the park. Since those Protectrons were given military-grade weapons, he was really concerned that something might happen. He wrote a letter to his supervisor, didn't get a response, so he wrote a letter directly to John Caleb Bradburton. Looks like Bradburton's executive assistant, Peyton Huxley, agreed with the manager at the Galactic Zone, even going as far as to put together a proposal for shutting down the Galactic Zone, but it was John Caleb Bradburton himself who said no. Up until this point, I was willing to give John Caleb Bradburton the benefit of the doubt. After all, he was preoccupied with Project Cobalt, and I admired him. He's a visionary who put together this whole park. But now we know that he personally chose to be reckless with the lives of the people who worked here and the park attendants in order to maximize his profits. In the next one, incoming mail from L.B. Shelton, Security Department. 
Sir, I've done as you've requested and informed all security personnel about our problem with the AFAD group. We're doing the best we can to keep them as far away from Safari Adventure as possible, but we're understaffed. I need every man and woman I can get. But you've assigned 12 of my people to Project Cobalt and have yet to replace them. Any help is appreciated, sir. Have a wonderful day. As we learned when we explored the Safari Adventure, the security staff L.B. Shelton had wasn't enough. The radical AFAD group eventually succeeded in kidnapping a lead scientist at the park. We learned that yet again Project Cobalt was to blame. But why was John Caleb Bradburton diverting all of his park's resources towards this Project Cobalt? In the next one, outgoing mail to Peyton Huxley, executive assistant. I've started reviewing the Hidden Cappy contest details and I had a question. So I actually have to receive the contest winners in my office in person? If so, have you considered how Project Cobalt could affect that idea? I'll do it for now, but we'll have to revisit the issue once my transfer is complete. Anyway, I promise you that I'll submit the rest of my comments and changes this week. I've been too preoccupied with Project Cobalt and I've definitely put it off for too long. Don't worry, Peyton. If I take any longer, just tell the marketing team to come after me with the torches and the pitchforks. Why would Project Cobalt make it difficult for him to meet people in person? His transfer, his transfer where? To, what, another office? In the next one, incoming mail from Kate Levitt, Beverageer Division. Sir, I appreciate your enthusiasm over the quantum beverage idea, but I really think we should run more tests before we just send it out to the market. The isotope that we're using is strontium-90, which is extremely radioactive. It's perfect for the military's applications, but even with Rex's purification distilling process, it can be dangerous. Now, I know that the bright blue bottles will look wonderful on store shelves, and we stand to make a lot of money with this product, but think of the long-term effects it can have. We already know that it causes the imbiber's urine to glow, and while others in the beverage ear lab find that amusing, I find something like that coming out of my body disturbing. I have a battery of tests that I'd like to perform before we release the product to the Washington DC test market. All I ask is a six to eight month delay. I wait your answer. We understand this letter a little bit more after exploring the beverage ear lab inside the world of refreshment. That is where Project Cobalt took place. Kate Levitt here was a Project Cobalt scientist, and she was the only Project Cobalt scientist who held any moral reservations about what they were doing, as is evidenced by this message. You can learn about her story and the full story of Project Cobalt in my video on the topic that you can watch here. And this ties in with Fallout 3 lore. We learned in Fallout 3 from Sierra Petrovita herself that Nuka-Cola Quantum did indeed make your urine glow. And this one email helps explain why we find so much Nuka-Cola Quantum in the Capital Wasteland. This email tells us that Washington, D.C. was their test market. It's clear that John Killer Bradburton did not give Kate the time she asked for. Instead, they released it to the Washington, D.C. test market, as evidenced by the fact that the day the bombs dropped was the very day Nuka-Cola Quantum was released to the public, which means it had already been tested, and as evidenced by the multiple truckloads of Nuka-Cola Quantum that we find in transit in the ruins of D.C. And this explains why we don't find any Nuka-Cola Quantum in the Mojave Wasteland. Well, except for one bottle in the ruins of Hopeville. And then to explain all of the Nuka-Cola Quantum we find here in Boston, we must conclude that Boston, like DC, was a test market. In the final one, outgoing mail to Peyton Huxley, executive assistant. Absolutely loved the Nuka Condolences fruit and cheese baskets you sent out to the families of our early prototype quantum flavor testers. Great idea. I think I loved the fine print of the health damage waiver you had them sign before they joined up even more. Saved us billions, I suspect. You're at the top of your game, Peyton, and maybe someday you'll be sitting in the big chair. For now, enjoy that shiny new quantum blue Corvega you found parked in your driveway this morning. You earned it. And here John Caleb Bradburton reveals himself to be a monster. Exactly how many people died while flavor testing Nuka-Cola Quantum? We first learned about these fruit and cheese condolences packages when we explored the Nuka-Cola bottling plant in Fallout 3. We read about them on the research terminal, where we learned that all of the test subjects who imbibed isotope CE770 died within three days of ingestion. 
This wasn't some oversight by a mid-level researcher, and the cheese baskets weren't some out-of-touch response by some middle manager. They were sent by Brad Burton's personal assistant, and Brad Burton himself praised him for it. How could such a visionary who built such an amazing park have so little basic humanity? Backing out of the terminal, if we turn around, we see Brad Burton's safe mounted into the wall. If we manage to pick this expert lock, we find quite a stash of ammunition and a holotape, General Braxton's visit. So the Braxton we read about in the terminal was a general? Why would a US general need Brad Burton's health documentation? Look, Brad Burton, I didn't fly down from DC to get jerked around. It's hard to believe. You either sign off on Project Cobalt or I can walk right out that door. This isn't like deciding what color bottle to pick for our next flavor, General. You're asking me to take my laboratories and my beverage years and basically turn them over to your team. I need assurances that my people and my facilities are going to be treated with the respect that they deserve. I could have been here before the war. You and I both know that's a load of horse shit. What it was like. Stop treating me like one of your soft drink competitors. I'm here representing the U.S. military. I already told you you'd be well compensated. Now cut the crap and tell me what you're really after. Fine. I want in on the military's Leap X program. What? How the hell did you know about that? Let's just say you're not the only one in this room that can throw his weight around in Washington, General. I've been following the program ever since its inception, and I have to say that I'm impressed. The ability to keep a human in a state of veritable immortality using a machine? Now that's something Whoa. that I didn't expect from the military. This is amazing. Look, you want me to agree to this proposal? Then get me on the Leap X list, and I'll sign whatever you want. I always knew you were a greedy son of a bitch, John. But the last thing I expected to hear is that you were afraid of death. If you know so much about Leapex, then you know it's in its infancy and there are a lot of kinks to be worked out. It isn't as easy as throwing a switch and suddenly you can live forever. Stop trying to talk me out of it. We both know the enemy is developing chemical and biological weapons, and that my beverageers are the top organic chemists in the world. Our countries are in a race where no one comes in second, I I General. Been here before the war. So you need to ask yourself, mm -hmm. can you really afford to stand life. here and say no? You had this all figured out before I even arrived, didn't you? Okay, fine. You want in on the Leapex program, you got yourself a deal. You know, maybe immortality is what's best for you, Brad Burton. Be a goddamn shame to let that ego go to waste. So John Caleb Brad Burton sought immortality. He knew exactly what the US military was going to ask of him, and he knew what he wanted from the military in return. But this is the first time we've heard about the Leap X program. Did it work? Is John Caleb Brad Burton still alive? We learned in his terminal that he was working with vault to build some sort of special project, and that the workers hid a button near his greatest achievement. The button is not hard to find. If we head over to the Nuka-Cola machine, we find it on the side. Look at that! Mr. Brad Burton, you were one sneaky devil. And here is where the infamous glitch starts. Here's how it's supposed to work. You walk into the elevator, punch the button, and when you arrive on the other side... Wow! What is this place? Let's take a closer look. Sierra appears, and together you run towards the vault. But in many games, she fails to appear, or she appears and doesn't move. And because of that, we can't proceed with the quest. 
Thankfully, for some reason, everything worked correctly this time. Sierra waits by a western door, but before we go that way, let's explore everything we passed. Heading back to the entrance, we see that this entryway to the vault is expansive, and it was indeed built by vault -Tec. We see vault -Tec and their logo emblazoned on boxes and shipping containers all over this area. We find a garage door to the east and a forklift in front of it. This must have been used to bring construction supplies into the vault before they buried it. We don't find anything else on this side, so going through the big vault door, we see that this entryway is just like any other vault. JCB must have contracted vault Tech to build this pretty late in their vault building careers. It looks like many of the later model vaults. We find a Nuka-Cola Victory hiding behind two boxes near to a table in the southeastern corner of this entryway, and a whole bunch of fuel sitting on a shelf. Then if we go down some steps to this lower area, we find boxes blocking our way, and then one Nuka-Cola Quartz, glowing by a stack of chairs. Moving to the south, we find a stack of 30 nuka Kid tickets, but that's all we find down here. So heading back up the stairs, we can check in with Sierra. Hi, Sierra. After you. Opening the door. Hmm, now this looks interesting. Come on. What on earth? Wait. No. It can't be. That's John Caleb Bradburton! Or at least it's his head. Wow! Who... Who are you? I haven't seen a real human face in so long. I had given up all hope. Oh my god! It's alive! He's alive! My name's Sierra, sir. I'm your biggest admirer. I love Nuka-Cola more than anything! This is such an honor. You there, with the pit boy What are you doing here? We used the contest code to get in. What the hell happened to you? I made a devil's bargain, though I didn't know it at the time. This whole thing is Sierra's idea. She came here to solve your hidden Cappy contest? The hidden Cappy contest? It all seems so long ago. Another lifetime. That was before I became this monster. Before I was trapped here for centuries to suffer in solitude. Oh, this has to be a joke. You trespass in my private vault, in my office, in my amusement park, and you have the gall to treat me like some joke. Oh, what's the use? Look at me. Look at me! I'm a monster, trapped in a prison of my own making. This was General Braxton's plan all along. Damn the man. He called it Project Cobalt. In exchange for my weapon design, he would give me access to life-extending technology. I'm such a fool for taking him at his word. He never told me that this would be the price. <laughs> Looks like Brad Burton has spent 200 years convincing himself that General Braxton somehow fooled him. But we heard the holotape. We heard John Caleb Brad Burton himself bring up the Leap X program. And we heard Braxton even give Brad Burton a warning. Brad Burton's exact response was... Stop trying to talk me out of it. So our head in a jar here has conveniently forgotten those details. Who was General Braxton? He was one of the top men in the Army Research Laboratory's Weapons and Materials Division. He'd taken a keen interest in my quantum mechanics research and offered me a trade. In exchange for my assistance on a top secret weapons project, he gave me access to an experimental process that would artificially extend my life. Like a fool, I leapt before I looked. I've certainly paid the price for my short-sightedness. Huh. Smart enough to invent Nuka-Cola, but you still fell for that? Yes, make your jokes. But I've still accomplished ten times more in a single lifetime than anyone I've met, including you. As long as one person in this world still enjoys Nuka-Cola, my legacy remains intact no matter what I've been reduced to. Uh, when something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. You don't think I know that? You don't think I contemplated my folly for decades on end? 
I do not need some interloper to remind me of my greatest tragedy. I can't imagine what you must have gone through. I'm... I'm truly sorry, Mr. Bradburton. A... Uh, a weapon? I don't believe it. Why would the genius who brought so much joy to the world want to make something destructive? Genius is restless, madam. It must expand, seek new challenges, and explore new frontiers. So yes, a weapon. It was going to be a quantum-enhanced variant of the standard portable tactical warhead. In fact, the prototypes are stored in this very chamber. You can have them on one condition. I want you to shut off the power to this machine that's keeping me alive. I want to die. What? No! Are you really sure you want to die? I've had plenty of time to think about it. Come on. You're a disembodied head, trapped in a vault. You've got so much to live for. Despite your obvious sarcasm, you clearly recognize my situation for the living hell that it is. There's gotta be a better solution than killing you. That's easy for you to say. Standing there on your own two legs, able to go where you wish and do what you want. Yeah. If our places were reversed, I'd probably want the same thing. Then I trust you will honor my wish. You can't kill him! He's a great man! He invented Nuka-Cola! The best thing in the world! Lady, you don't know what a torment it is. Being trapped here alone, and staring at the same wall, decade after decade. Now please shut up, while I talk to your more rational friend here. I realize that what I'm asking isn't easy, but there's something in it for you. When the power is cut, the door to the prototype storage room will open automatically. Take anything you want. I don't care anymore. Just please, set me free at last. I can't bear this loneliness any longer. Wait, 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 wait. I have an idea. Mr. Bradburton wants to die because he's lonely, right? Well, maybe I could stay with him, you know? Keep him company, give him someone to talk to. He's like a hero to me. You've got a point, but I want compensation for the prototype ammo I won't be getting. Well, uh, I do have one thing that might interest you. Yeah, but if I don't cut the power, then that door doesn't open, and, and I don't get my prototype ammo. At least hear me out. That's not happening. I want that experimental ammunition. I know, I know, but I have something else that I can offer you instead. If he lives, I don't get the prototype ammo. What can you offer to make this worth my while? Well, uh, I do have one thing that might interest you. I've got a limited edition Nuka-Cola jumpsuit. It's really stylish, and not many were made. It's one of my most treasured possessions, but... Well... I'm willing to let you have it. A Nuka-Cola jumpsuit? Ha! That's a paltry prize compared to what I'm offering. The choice is yours. But I beg you to honor my wishes. There is no one else who can help me. I sort of feel sorry for him. What a choice. To kill a man responsible for the deaths of so many others, which is what he wants us to do, or to allow him to suffer perpetually. What about Sierra's offer to keep you company? Wouldn't that help? I admit I'm flattered by her admiration, but I'm so tired in ways that words could not explain. I've lived far too long already, and I'm prepared to move on. I await your decision. I... Uh, I haven't decided yet. I see. I can only hope your sense of compassion compels you to do the right thing. I've been a prisoner long enough. I'm almost afraid to ask, but... What's your decision? What about the secret Nuka-Cola formula you think is locked up in that vault? That was before we found John Caleb Bradburton in the flesh. Well, mostly. Who knows? Maybe he'll tell me the Nuka-Cola formula himself, along with all kinds of other things? <laughs> that would be incredible. Please. 
tell me that you'll let him live. I'm still thinking about it. Just please think carefully. If you shut off the power, there's no going back or changing your mind. We'll start by giving him his wish. So, have you made up your mind? I'll do it. I'll... I'll shut off the power. Thank you. Now please do get on with it. I I'm ready. I've been ready for a long, long time. I want that prototype and I'm... I'm going to get it. You really want to condemn one of the greatest minds of his generation to die? Even though I've offered you a better option. And just so you can get your hands on a weapon? <sighs> Guess I didn't realize you were so cold-hearted and selfish. Fine then. Destroy one of our... Our national treasures! To put Brad Burton out of his misery, we have to access the main power control to the Northwest. Free at last. No! Mr. Bradford! I'm sorry! It must take a long time for the muscles or nerves in his head to stop functioning because even after he dies, he still moves his eyes. Which is a bit trippy. I can't believe someone as smart as Mr. Brad Burton would be fooled into thinking you could live forever. I guess he was terrified of growing old. He did fear death, but this was his own fault. He was warned that the project had kinks. After flipping the fuse box, we see that the vault door has opened. Inside, we find a Nuka mixer station, some supplies on a shelf, and on a table before us, we find the Nuka Cola formula. I wonder just how many billions of dollars had been spent protecting this formula before the bombs dropped. Sadly, this just appears in our inventory as a miscellaneous item. We can't read it to ever learn the exact formula for Nuka Cola. Here we also find a key to Brad Burton's wall mounted safe behind his desk, in case we couldn't pick it, a box filled with Nuka Cola, a quartz, dark, grape, victory, wild, and quantum, and we find some Nuka Nukes a brand new type of ammunition, as well as the Nuka Nuke schematics. Now we can craft Nuka Nukes. And on a shelf nearby, we find the Nuka Nuke launcher. Despite the fact that this is a very powerful weapon, it's not legendary, and that's because we can turn any Fat Man into a Nuka Nuke launcher. All we have to do is modify the Fat Man to launch Nuka Nukes instead of Mini Nukes. After looting the schematics, we can craft Nuka Nukes at any chemistry station. One Nuka Nuke costs one Mini Nuke and one bottle of Nuka Cola Quantum, making it a pretty viable type of ammunition to craft. The Nuka Nuke Launcher deals a whopping 833 damage, compared to a Fat Man's 450. That's nearly double the damage. It does consume a bit more AP in VATS, 75 for the Nuka Nuke Launcher, compared to 60 for the Fat Man. But otherwise, it shares the same characteristics as a Fat Man, with a range of 117 and an accuracy of 63. Because the Nuka Nuka Launcher is just a mod of a regular Fat Man, it can be removed and attached to any other Fat Man, including a legendary one. In this way, we could get a two-shot Nuka Nuka Launcher. If, for example, we attached the Nuka Nuke mod to Big Boy, which is a unique fat man with the two-shot legendary effect that we can buy from Arturo in Diamond City, we do double the damage. The Nuka Nuke launcher, like the Fat Man, benefits from the same perks, Heavy Gunner, Demolition Expert, and Bloody Mess. And since it's relatively easy to make the ammunition for this thing, Nuka Cola Quantum, after all, is plentiful all over the park, the Nuka Nuke launcher then becomes an essential weapon for any Big Guns character. After looting some first aid kits and an explosives box on the ground, we can hand the Nuka Cola formula over to Sierra Petrovita. You wanted the Nuka Cola formula? Here it is. So it really was here. I'm grateful, but don't think this means I've forgiven you. You killed the man who was my greatest hero. A man who revolutionized the soft drink industry, and whose creations put smiles on a million faces. Who the hell are you to just walk in here and destroy all that? You're being selfish, Sierra. This wasn't about what you wanted. 
It was about what he needed. What he needed? I hadn't thought of it that way. He made a choice, and I respected that choice. You should too. I... I guess so. He was trapped. And alone. For centuries. And I set him free from that hell. I did the right thing. But what if... No. You're right. I'm thinking only about myself. About what I wanted. I know you're disappointed, Sierra, but... Ask yourself. What was best for him? Well... Maybe you're right. I guess I didn't consider his feelings as much as I should have. It's just that... Never, not in my wildest dreams, did I think I'd get the chance to talk to Mr. Brad Burton in person. To get an opportunity like that and then have it snatched away. It hit me pretty hard. Still, I can't overlook the fact that for one glorious shining moment, I got to meet the man who invented Nuka-Cola. I'll never forget that. Not ever. And it wouldn't have been possible without your help. Now that you've got the formula for Nuka-Cola, what are you going to do with it? I'm not a chemist, but I might try to brew some up, just for fun. If that fails, well, I still got a new centerpiece for my collection. It's been an interesting experience. For both of us. If you really want to thank me, thank me with caps. A mercenary to the end, huh? I guess you've earned it. You're welcome. Here. I know it's not much, but you really went above and beyond the Call of Duty. I think I'll stick around here for a while and see what else I can find. By the time I'm done, I'm going to need a much bigger building to house my Nuka-Cola museum. And with that, we complete the quest Campy in a Haystack, and she gives us the caps that we negotiated earlier in Episode 2. I wish you could have given me more time with Brad Burton before you cut the power. I can't believe he was alive all that time, stuck in that room. That must have been awful. Guess I'll be heading home soon. Not much left for me here. But, of course, the other option is to side with Sierra and to leave Brad Burton alive. I'm not shutting off the power. With Sierra to keep you company, I think you'll both be happier. What? Will you not respect the wishes of a man who has suffered the way I have? Please, I beg you to reconsider. I'll accept your offer. I won't shut the power off. Thank you, thank you, thank you! You're doing the right thing! After all, this is a great man we're talking about. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a living legend to talk to. Good luck running Nuka World! Choosing this option, we again complete Cappy in a Haystack, but instead of being rewarded with the caps, we get the Nuka World Jumpsuit. The Nuka World Jumpsuit is unique. It's the only one in the entire game. We can't find it anywhere else. It's a full body outfit that grants us plus two DR, plus five to radiation resistance, and plus one to both intelligence and perception. Well, this makes the decision easy, right? The Nuka Nuka Launcher is way better. But wait, the final distinction that the Nuka World jumpsuit has is that it's the only piece of armor or clothing in the entire Nuka World DLC that accepts Ballistic Weave. This means that, aside from using mods, if we want to roleplay a Nuka World mechanic, but we don't want to use power armor, this is the route to go. It has the Nuka World logo on the back, and on the front, we see the words maintenance inside a badge over the left breast. It shares the model of other jumpsuits in the game, but it has a completely unique texture. It's orange with white lining, it's pretty filthy, and the pant legs are tucked into the thick rubber boots. But I think it's a great looking outfit. Not sure exactly why I like it so much, maybe it's the orange. It does, however, consume all armor slots except for the helmet, so we can't wear any armor over it. But we could put Ballistic Weave on a hat, and with this, have a full outfit of Ballistic Weave. If we ever come back after Brad Burden has spent some time with Sierra, we find him surprisingly upbeat. I'm pleased to know that even now, the legacy of my work is still appreciated. Sierra has made that very clear to me. I won't deny that it's nice to have some company again. 
I commend your diligence. It can't have been easy to find your way in here. Help yourself to anything that you think is useful. None of it means much to me anymore. You can't know how wonderful a real conversation can be until you've gone without one for a few hundred years. <laughs> this is actually a little disappointing. I thought maybe I could punish Brad Burton by not only keeping him alive, but dooming him to spending the next 30 or 40 years with Sierra Petrovita. That's punishment in and of itself, isn't it? <laughs> but no, apparently he likes it and he appreciates the company. So if you want to punish Brad Burton, neither appear to do so. I'm going to see what else I can find in this place to add to my collection. This trip was totally worth it. I'm so glad I came here. Someday, I should write a book about all this. And before you ask, yes, you'll be a big part of the story. That was quite an adventure, wasn't it? We can then loot his office here. We see another collection of Nuka-Cola, Nuka-Cola Cherry, and Nuka-Cola Quantum on a table here. There's a display shelf to the north with more Nuka-Cola in it and some tokens. A statue in one, some cutlery in another, and a restored Lone Wanderer motorcycle. I have to admit, though, that I'm disappointed by the lack of detail in this thing. Nearby, we see a gorgeous Chrysler's Cherry Bomb. This vehicle has plenty of wonderful detail. We then find three Nuka-Cola lunch boxes, giving us an opportunity to get some rare goods. And to the west, we find a small room lined with consoles. On a mobile cart, we find Brad Burton's project terminal. Leapex system remote connection failure. Contact Leapex team immediately. So the Leapex team, presumably part of the US military, had a remote connection to John Caleb Bradburton? Does that mean that they could have killed him from afar? In the first one, Acquisitions, we find four different companies that Nuka-Cola acquired. The first, Merle's Very Cherry Soda, original name, Merle's Very Cherry Soda. Previous patent holder, Merle Harveston. New name, Nuka Cherry. Launched. Flavor profile, Nuka-Cola and cherry mixture. Notes. Original formula was a local home-brewed pure cherry soft drink. Made slight adjustments to formula, but otherwise left flavor intact. Mixed with Nuka-Cola, then enhanced with color to boost visual appeal. So, J.C. Bradburton, the genius chemist, came up with the Nuka-Cola recipe, which was so delicious that it dominated the soda market, but had to acquire local companies for at least some of his other flavors. In the next one, Grape Pearl Soda, original name Grape Pearl Soda, previous patent holder, Joni Chang, new name Nuka Grape, launched. Flavor profile Grape, original formula sold overseas. Flavor profile virtually unchanged, slight ingredient adjustments for cost purposes, full rebranding and repackaging completed as per Nuka-Cola marketing division. So Nuka Grape is essentially just rebranded and packaged Grape Pearl Soda with no ingredient ties to the original Nuka-Cola. I guess you don't need to retain the authenticity of your 17 fruit flavor profile if the dominant flavor is going to be grape. In the next one, Sharon's Down Home Country Lemon. Original name, Sharon's Down Home Country Lemon. Previous patent holder, Sharon Lawrence. New name, Nuka-Cola Clear. Awaiting final approval. Flavor profile, Lemon Lime. Notes, original formula holds promise, but ingredients are quite expensive. Don't recommend use of current formula for cost-effective production. We'll try and work out the kinks to get the flavor ready as soon as possible. And now we more fully understand why Brad Burton didn't go ahead with Nuka-Cola Clear. The original ingredients were too expensive. He needed to revise the formula for a more cost-effective production. And in the final one, packed full of Joe. Original name, packed full of Joe. Previous patent holder, William Lee. New name, Nuka Boost. Experimental. Flavor profile, Nuka-Cola and coffee mixture. Notes, original formula adjusted to mix with Nuka-Cola flavor profile. Initial taste tests not positive. Recommend we rethink this flavor combination. Well, it's no wonder then why we don't find this one anywhere around the park and why we can't mix one at a Nuka mixer station. And I can understand why coffee and cola mixed? <laughs> Backing out of this, we can read more about Project Cobalt. Project Cobalt entries go as far back as March 17th, 2076, 
all signed by John Caleb Bradburton. General Braxton stopped by my office today. I already knew he was coming. My contacts in D.C. saw to that. He asked for exactly what I expected. The use of Nuka World's beverage ears for a military chemical and weapons program. I told him I'd do it if he gave me the information on the military's Leap X program, life extension and prolongation. The look on his face when I asked that was priceless. As expected, he said yes. The moment the LeapX data arrives, I'm putting a team to work on it right away. It's obvious that this world is headed for the end, and I intend to outlast it all. So like Robert House before him, the CEO of Nuka-Cola John Caleb Bradburton was able to predict the nuclear apocalypse. And this reminds us what we heard from Desmond Lockhart in the Point Lookout DLC of Fallout 3. He's the one that told us that the rich and powerful from the old world were all playing something called the Great Game. He didn't specify exactly what this great game was, but it involved surviving while taking out many of the other rich and powerful from before the war. Desmond and Calvert were both part of the pre-war elite who were fighting each other as part of the great game. Then we learn of House and now Brad Burton, who both sought their own ways to survive the apocalypse and were part of the rich and powerful elite. Could both of these men have been trying to participate in the great game? It's clear that even if this was Brad Burton's intention, he ended up failing. The man we meet in this bunker has lost all of his fight. In the next one, August 27th, 2076, I had vault modify my personal vault to accommodate the machinery required to keep the Leapex system running. It's costing me a fortune, and I've had to divert money from the amusement park, but who cares? My money in the park won't be worth anything when the world is a smoking ruin. I've flown a few of Leapex's researchers down here to make sure the prototype works. I bet they're glad to still have a job, seeing as all the military's money got diverted to wartime resources. I'm hearing complaints from my Nuka World team about the cutbacks, but they'll just have to make do. So the government was funding Leap X, but due to the escalation of the war, had to divert their resources. It was Brad Burton's interest that even revived the program, and it looks as if the research and implementation continued here in Nuka World, which likely means that Brad Burton is the one and only experiment of the government's Leap X program. Thus, we shouldn't expect to find other heads in jars. Well, unless Futurama exists in the Fallout universe after the Divergence. And we'd better understand why he began to neglect his park and his company. The world was ending. He knew it was ending. He was one of the few who knew. Every decision after he found out was focused on his own survival. Can we blame a man for using his own assets to ensure his own survival? After all, is that not what wastelanders do each and every day? Is there a more responsible and humanitarian way for Brad Burton to have set this vault up, ensured his own survival, and also cared for his employees and the park patrons? The what-ifs are many, but we have no answers. In the next one, October 20th, 2076, Meekum's work with Project Cobalt struck gold. His team came up with a custom isotope based on strontium-90 he's calling Quantum. He believes he can use the isotope to weaponize almost anything in the military's arsenal. He's come up with a few prototypes like the Nuka Nuke, and we've even used the Quantum to enhance one of the military's power armor suits. Ironically, Meekum believes we can use this isotope somewhat safely as an ingredient in a new Nuka-Cola soft drink flavor. By reducing most of the harmful effects of the isotope, the Quantum will actually glow longer than the ingredients we use in Quartz and Victory. In fact, I've told Meekum to start distilling it immediately and call it Nuka-Cola Quantum. Well, if Quantum can glow longer than Quartz or Victory, how long will that be? Because Quartz and Victory glow just fine 200 years later. In the next one, January 19th, 2077, the original intention of Leapax was to create a living biosuit to preserve my body after it would normally expire. But now I've been told by those idiots on the Leapax team that it's not possible. Leapax requires so much power and so many special components, it can only accommodate no more than 15 pounds of organic matter. That leaves me no choice. If I want to prolong my life, I'll have to have them preserve only my head. I've told them to proceed. 
I haven't come this far just to give up and await the inevitable. He was so convinced that the nuclear apocalypse was coming that he even agreed to have them sever his head. But I wonder if they had the technology to preserve his head and he had military contacts, why didn't Brad Burton have his head placed in some sort of mobile robot chassis? Like a Robobrain chassis or a modified one. That way he would at least be able to move around and leave the bunker. It seems almost impossible that after putting such an extraordinary amount of effort into developing technology that could keep him immortal, that they would overlook something as practical as that. And in the final one, April 2nd, 2077, this is my final entry. Today, I will be undergoing the surgical procedure to have my head removed and transferred into the Leapak system. If anything should happen, I've instructed Peyton Huxley, my executive assistant, to handle my affairs. Peyton is the only one outside the Leapex team who knows about this procedure, and I am entrusting him to visit me daily and keep me informed on the events happening on the outside of my vault. So he had the procedure done in April. April of the very year the bombs dropped. Well, he did a better job of acting before the apocalypse than House did. At least he achieved his goal before the bombs dropped. None of the other outgoing mail messages we found on the terminal upstairs were dated, so we don't know what he was able to do after he did the procedure. Was he able to write and respond to mail? What did he expect to be able to achieve in this jar? Did he not think that far ahead? There is one final ending. We sided with Sierra, she gave us the jumpsuit, but at any time, we can always walk over to the wall and flip the switch. Finally, free at last. No! Mr. Bradford! I'm sorry. You bitch! You said you'd let Brad Burton live! You're gonna pay for that! Ah. Ah. Open fire! Ah. <laughs> she turns hostile. Oh no! Not Sierra Petrovida. Oh, she may be a little bit of a loon, but there's still something endearing about the girl. I suppose I can understand why she eventually became violent, despite how horrified she was at the thought of JCB creating weapons earlier. We did betray her trust. Perhaps this was a momentary lapse of judgment, which led to her violence. On her corpse, we don't find much, just a bottle and cappy shirt and jeans. But this is not unique. It can be sold by Nuka World merchants, including Caitlin and Shelby in the Nuka Town marketplace. In this way, however, we get the Nuka World jumpsuit and the Nuka Nuke launcher and everything else in this vault. But for me and this character, she has no need for the Nuka Nuke launcher. She's not a Big Guns character. Plus, I kind of wanted to punish John Killer Brad Burton for everything he did before the war. And I just like Sierra Petrovita so much, I'd hate to disappoint her. So in my Brotherhood game, he sided with Brad Burton and got the Nuka Nuke launcher. But in this game with my Railroad Paper Assassin, she sided with Sierra and gave Brad Burton a brand new friend. But what did you do in your game? Which option do you think is more of a punishment for Brad Burton? Which do you think is more moral? Killing a man who requests it despite the evil he did in his life? Or leaving him alive knowing it's going to subject him to an inhuman type of torture? That kind of torture no one should ever be subjected to. Eternal life in solitude. Let me know what you decided in the comments section below. I publish new Fallout videos every single week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of both men's and women's sizes and in a wide array of colors. They also come on other products, smartphone cases, mugs, posters, pillows, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon this week with a brand new video.